Hello, everyone. You ready to get into this tonight? Yeah. I guess I better find my clicker. Uh, I planned on 90 minutes, and so we got 60 minutes, so we're going to go at it tonight, all right? I have several objectives I want to do tonight. I want to first expand your understanding of the universe and yourself from a biblical paradigm. I want to view the modern version of the Watcher Matrix that is being constructed around us today with things that are going on around the world. At the same time, I want to call, I want to present a call for maturity in our service to God, our kingdom priesthood, and to develop a higher level of spiritual warfare. How many people know things are getting real? Now, I'm not just here to tell you about all the stupid stuff the enemy is doing. I'm ex-military as well as being in ministry. You line out what the enemy is doing, and then you show the guys where to plant the C4 to blow it up. Amen. And that's what I'm wanting to do today. Now, before we get started, this is a prophetic word that Jesus gave. He brought his disciples to Mount Hermon, and he spoke these words, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't care what the Marxists want to do. I don't care what the Democrats want to do or any other rats want to do. It will not prevail against the church of the living God. Come on now. But we need to understand a couple of things. Jesus was speaking prophetically not only to his disciples, but he was looking ahead in time to where we are right now because he brought them to Mount Hermon and it's a, very unique, it's a very unique place. At Mount Hermon, he brought them to the very spot that the watchers descended that we get Genesis 6 out of. And when you understand the book of Enoch, most of them were incarcerated by Almighty God because of the sin they did. So when he told Peter and he told all the rest of them there that the gates of hell, they never had to face a watcher. Come on, they never had to face a watcher. It's the entrance to the gates of Hades. There's a cave there that the Greeks taught that's how to get into Hades is through that cave. There's a Grotto de Pan there. The fortress of Nimrod is on top of that mountain. And if you look at topography, and we've got this here, uh, when you look at the topography of Mount, Mount Hermon, it's literally a goat's head. Many researchers believe that that may be the place that Azazel himself is incarcerated by God. And why, why Azazel and why a goat's head? On the Day of Atonement, there was, there was two goats that were used in the ceremony. One was sacrificed for God. The other one was something called a scapegoat. And it was sent out into the wilderness. The sins of Israel was laid on its head, and it was sent out into the wilderness. In Hebrew, scapegoat is Azazel. And so when Jesus was saying, listen, when we get to the end times, that the full council, because biblically and archaeologically, when you look at the gates of the city, that's where its leaders were. That's where its generals were. That's where its judges were. When the full council of hell gathered together, it will not prevail against my church. Jesus was prophesying to us, and he said, and whatsoever they bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. We have a higher level of authority than we have been taught in the church. We've got to understand what the enemy is doing. We have got to discover who we are in Christ, and we have got to learn to begin moving in it. We can no longer set on our blessed assurance with our, with our Willy Wonka golden tickets for the rapture, thinking that we're not going to have to grow. We're not going to have to face giants. You were born again to slay giants. You were born into the kingdom to take the enemy down, to pull men out of the fire, to save souls, to change nations, and we're worried about whether the preacher goes too long on Sunday or Saturday. Oh, don't get me going there. Next slide. Hidden in plain sight. How many have seen this on the back of your $1 bill? Now, Tom Horn and his books have showed that, that the, this... Uh, announcing the New World Order is actually taken from a prophecy by the Kumain Sibyl. 
and she was not only a very, pro, a very famous Apollyonistic prophetess, she's so famous that she's on the Sistine Chapel, along with Jeremiah and all the rest. And she prophesied the returning of Apollo, which is a Nephilim as far as I'm concerned, as best I can study. But everybody talks about the eye. The eye of Ra, the eye of Horus, the eye, yeah, 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 yeah. But can I ask you something? What symbol would you use if you were known as a watcher? On the back of our $1 bill, the Masons have been de declaring that their gods are going to come back. But if they get into the first heaven, that's my territory. They are operating in my area of operation, my AO. And I have permission to shoot at will. You don't have to wait to hear from headquarters. Jesus said, when they show up, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Come on now. One of the things I want to get in today, when, 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 when you begin studying Scripture, there are divine patterns that God always uses. And one of them, when, when Moses built the tabernacle in the wilderness, he was shown a pattern in heaven. And he said, build it according to the pattern. And I believe that pattern was actually within the consciousness of, of uh, ancient tribals people. Because when you look at, at Abraham's Bedouin tent, it had three chambers. You know, so it's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg, you know? But, but they, they understood the, uh, the concept of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the universal template that explains everything. You're a tripartite being, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is the holy of holies. Your soul is the holy place. And everybody knows what the outer court is, and it can, it can expand, can't it? Okay. <laughs> How do you live your spirituality? It has to be from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's a universal template. And so with that understanding, we can begin looking at some things. We can look at not only following the pattern, but in Genesis 1-1 where it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now the King James was wrong on this verse. And there was a mighty rushing wind heard in the auditorium. And everybody went, <gasps> And they did the best they could, but we need to understand, especially in the era that the King James was written, Prior to that, the generation before Hebrew was almost a lost language. And it was, it was being resurrected among the Jewish people, and they brought in scholars, but we have learned a lot about the Hebrew since then. Hashamayim, the heavens. Im on the end of Hebrew is plural. Hasha, Hashama does not appear once in Scripture. It's always plural. It's always heavens. When God created the heavens, we know from the Apostle Paul that he was caught up into the third heaven where he fellowshiped with Jesus. So there's three heavens. When God made the heavens, he created it, he created it after the pattern of the tabernacle. Isn't that awesome? There's three heavens. Now when he created man, the Apostle Paul tells us that we're spirit, soul, and body. You were created to be a tabernacle, and it was always God's original plan. When God created Adam in the garden, he breathed the breath of life into him, and he became a living soul. He was spirit, soul, and body. And we are designed, we are designed, our body works in the first heaven, our soul operates in the second heaven, and when you're born again and the throne of God is in, the, is in your spirit, your spirit is connected to the throne of God. That was the way that man was created. Come on, this, this, that's why we need to quit being so cerebral when we get saved. It's got to be spirit first, mind second, and, and the body last. You got to learn to begin living and walking by the spirit. Now, this is my attempt to unify super string theory in the Bible. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get there. Super, uh, super string theory tells us that there are 11 dimensions including one temporal, but they missed what I call dimension zero. You see, they don't believe in hell. They don't believe in Tartarus. And why I call it dimension zero 
is because it's a place of no expression within all the three heavens. And so when you understand how God divided things up when he created the three heavens, the very last thing that he created, you know, we have, we've got to begin, God created the heavens and the earth. The word was without form. We can talk about how that was where the fall of Lucifer was and that there was an earth before that, but the earth also, re, also resided outside of time. When God said, let there be light, he didn't create the sun, he didn't create the stars. That's a fourth day principle. He created time. Time is, when you look at temporal mechanics, time is directly related to, to the speed of light. So what he did over all of, all of creation, all three heavens, he laid a ruler down called temporal time, and he made the devil go through time the way you and I do. So he can't, the devil's not omniscient. He's, 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 he, he, he does not feel, that when God, all of time is now. Jesus is still at creation. He's still at the cross. He's kicked back in the millennial reign. He's saying, what you're worried about? I got the devil handled. You know, he, he fills it all, but he makes the devil travel through time just like we do. He said, you want a war against me? You play checkers. I'll play 12-dimensional chess, okay? Because I know you can handle checkers. And he limited the devil. And based upon which heaven you're functioning in, time is different. The Bible says a day with the Lord, a thousand years is a day with the Lord. So in the third heaven, when we experience a thousand years, they experience a day. Science has proved this, that if I could go 99% of the speed of light, go out 12 hours away from the earth, come back 12 hours, to me, I, I, a day has passed. A thousand years would have passed on planet earth. But here's the scary part, and I ought to make evangelists out of every one of us. If you're, in the t if you're in dimension zero hell, a day on earth may feel like a thousand years there. We're not only discovering that, but we're also discovering that higher spatial dimensions, that distance is different. How does God translate Philip? And the next thing you know, he's out where the eunuch is. God just lifted up in hyperspace and did this, and, you know, 500 miles, he's there. Boy, that would come in handy to get into these conferences. <laughs> that or inventing a TARDIS. The fall of Lucifer. And I want to, and some of this I'm going to get into more on Sunday. But the Bible says that thou wast perfect in all thy ways to the day, from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. Lucifer, what he did is there's five I wills that Lucifer said. Five is the number of grace in the Bible. He tried to create a pseudo-grace to facilitate his ascension into Godhood. And what it did is that he was the anointed cherub that covers. It took that anointing and it corrupted it into something else. And it corrupted it into something called iniquity, uh, or aval in Hebrew, which literally is, a, which is uh, not only injustice and righteousness wrong, violent deeds of injustice. He gets violently opposed to the kingdom of God. He gets violently opposed to anything holy. Violently opposed. That's the very nature of iniquity. And that begin to, that's, that's what he uses to empower his kingdom. Is the iniquity force. But what's interesting is he's not all powerful like God is. How many know that when God created the heavens and the earth, it did not reduce his power one notch? You know, the only reason he rested on the seventh day was an example to us to quit our process of work to remember our Lord God. Because he knows what man's like and that we'll either work ourselves to death or we'll think that we did it. He says, you got to take the Sabbath out. Remember that I am the Lord your God. Rest and give me thanks for what I did through you. But it was, it was this power force and the, the occultists have known for a long time about this power force. I want you to read this. This is from Albert Pike from Morals and Dogma. He says, there is a nature, one most potent force. May the force be with you. I may have heard that. By means whereof that a single man could possess himself of it and should know how to direct it, could revolutionize and change the face of the world. Does that sound like the Antichrist? This force... Uh, has been known to the ancients. It is the universal agent whose supreme law is equilibrium and whereby if, by, if science could 
You see, the occult have always understood that sorcery and science were two sides of the same coin. When they look at the antediluvian age prior to the flood, the, the watchers brought technology with them. And occult power can flow through technology. Well, Mike, how do you know that? Have you ever listened to a sermon somebody did? It may have been recorded five years ago, and you watch it on your VCR or DVD player or listen to it on your radio, and the anointing of God is there. It can be, tra it can be recorded and later transmitted. You think God's side is the only side that can do that? Rock music that has had embedded occult significance and occult influence is released into the hearts of the youth. Even though they may listen to something recorded back in the 60s, it can flow through that technology into their hearts. And they knew that and said, if science could, why are we doing CERN? Why are we doing some of all the crazy things they're doing? They're trying to learn the scientific modality in this generation to tap back into that force to begin using it. If it, be, if it be possible to change the order of the seasons to produce in night the phenomenon of day and to send a thought in an instant around a word to heal or to slay at a distance uh, to our words, to our, again, to give to our words universal success and make them reverberate everywhere. This agent partially revealed by the blind guesses of the disciples of Mesmer and, and is precisely what the adepts of the Middle Ages called the elementary matter of the great work. And he gets into how the Gnostics have looked to use it. They all have been looking to how to harness this power. The Nazis uh, put a lot of effort. They, they may have called it the Vril Force or the Thule Force or whatever force uh, there is out there. In fact, I think George Lucas used the writings of Albert Pike to come up with the force that is used in Star Wars. He further writes, there is the life principle of the world, a universal agent, wherein are two natures and a double current of love and hate. Well, there's the light side and there's the dark side. Well, there's white witchcraft and there's black witchcraft. No, there is witchcraft. Come on. I want to give you another take on what the Apostle Paul was talking about in Ephesians 6.12. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the rulers of darkness of this world. Stop there. Every one of those in, in the Greek are personalities. They are talking about immortals, angels that fell. But when he talks about spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, it is not an entity. It's talking about spiritual iniquity. It is... You know, how many know that God has a river, the river of God, the, the, the moving of the Holy Spirit? The flip side, because Satan set up his kingdom as, as a dark negative image of what God does, he has a river of darkness that flows from his throne, that flows with the iniquity force. That's what these guys are trying to tap into to learn how to use. Okay? The Bible calls it the mystery of iniquity. I also want to introduce to you the possibility of a progressive falling away. How many have always heard that one-third of the angels fell when Lucifer fell? The problem is you get that from the last book of the Bible. Okay. When you look at it, it's in Revelation chapter 12, and it's up here on the screen. When you, when you look at this, Dake and others say, well, this is a parenthetical verse. That theological word, longer than mayonnaise, it means kung fu flashback. <laughs> but the old you know, Michael, the, the old kung fu movie where he's about ready to attack someone all of a sudden, here I was as a boy. <laughs> that doesn't fit into the scenario. It doesn't fit. It's linear in that portion. There is nothing in that scripture that would even suggest that there was a kung fu flashback of some prophetic significance. This is a war that's going to happen in the second heaven during the tribulation period. 
in which Satan is not only cast out of the third heaven, but they're all cast out of the second heaven, and they've got to walk as men in the first heaven. Oh, you masons and everything, you, you worship these guys? We'll let you see what they really look like. And it's a part of the fulfillment of, of Psalms 82 where it talks about the divine counsel, you're going to die as men. They can die as men now because they have been thrown to the first heaven and they can't ascend any higher. And by that time, one-third of the immortals will have fallen with Lucifer. But what I see is when I read Scripture, we have the fall of Lucifer between Genesis 1 and 1-2 when the world was made tav tavu, it was, it was made void. The prophets tell us God did not create the world to be tahu, the exact same Hebrew word. Many scholars believe that that's talking about the fall of Lucifer and that it's a recreation of the earth that we're witnessing after that. That's why God told Adam, replenish the earth. A lot of you guys have coffee cups in your hands. If the first time you get it filled, that is not replenishing that coffee cup. It's when you go back for a refill. It has the re in front of it. And I looked it up in Hebrew, and you know what it means? Replenish, okay? <laughs> exact same thing. Okay, now let me go back here. And so we, we have, then we have the Nechesh of the garden. People say that it was Lucifer in the garden. The problem with that is Lucifer is a cherub. When you examine the etymology of what the Nehesh, which later began translated as serpent, he's a seraph. He's a flaming serpent. He set that tree afire with his, with his presence. And you can, be, you can begin seeing the symmetry in the word. He does this, man falls, and then there's a kingdom built upon his information called Egypt. And God says, I'll call a man. I don't have to set a tree on fire. I'll just set a bush on fire, and I'll send him down there to take your kingdom down. His name was Moses. Why was the cross called a tree? The Nechesh started it in a tree. Jesus said, I'll end it in a tree. Can you see the symmetry here? A cherub is to guard the holiness of God, while a seraph is to proclaim the holiness of God. Two different creatures, so we see him fall in the garden. The watchers of Genesis 6, that's when I believe they fell. And then we have the principalities and powers and the rulers that fell, I believe, at the Tower of Babel. Because later on in Deuteronomy, and when you look at it, there's several modern verses, versions that translate it properly. That we, will, we, will, we will separate the nations according to to the numbers of the sons of God, the Bene Elohim is actually the, the best translation. Not Israel. Israel didn't exist at the Tower of Babel. It's, it's an impossibility. And so we have this progressive falling away. In fact, in Paul's heart, it, it was so real. He, he was telling the women that used to be priestesses for the oracles of Delphi that had their heads shaved until your hair grows out, wear a covering for the sake of the angels. Well, if, there wasn't, if it couldn't cause a problem for the angels, then why ever mention it? But by the time we get to the book of Revelation, the lines have finally been drawn and judgment has been brought down. Now, I want to give a different approach to Genesis 6. And, and I'm not going to talk about the genetics project that they had going on in creating Nephilim. There's something else that I think that we're really beginning to touch on. And it said, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil, evil, continually. You see, the antediluvian time was the time of the watchers. It was the time of the giants. It was the time of forbidden knowledge, DNA splicing, chimeras, advanced technology, sorcery. In fact, the technology and sorcery are two sides of the same coin. But what we never ask is, was there a mechanism that was utilized by the watchers to completely corrupt the hearts of men technologically? I believe there was. Before, bef you read right after the flood that all of a sudden all the continents were together and they were one. And then in the day of Peleg, they all separate. You put all the continents back together and all the ley lines match and there is a grid of ley lines and there are pyramids all over this planet, guys. There are pyramids on the ocean floors. There are pyramids. That, I mean, China has pyramids. There, 
what, what are Egyptians doing in China? They go down there for, the, for dinner? You know, what's the deal? They, they like Kung Pao chicken? What? The, but they, they had this grid that brought all the pyramids and other monolithic sites along with the ley lines, and it formed a power grid for the iniquity force to flow, and it darkened the hearts of men. Now, this, is a, this next is a slide from Stan Deo that he presented last year in Denver that what facilitated the flood was an asteroid strike that caused a tsunami that destroyed Atlantis, that caused a worldwide flood that so impacted the earth that it, 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 it caused the waters from the deep to break open. And I think it's interesting, the symmetry, there's also another asteroid coming during the tribulation period, as in the days of Noah. And what it did is it broke the grid. In fact, one of the most interesting things I'm finding right now with the New Age, the new movement, is to heal the ley lines. They want to they try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So we see that as a reality. One of the things that I have found in all the years that I have studied the elite is they never come at you one way, they come at you 40 ways. There's one of my favorite quotes from Doom is, observe the plans within plans within plans. And they work over centuries. They don't come up with a five-year plan. They come up with a 500-year plan. And they work it systematically as they're giving technology, as they learn to control the finances, and they do all kinds of things to see what button to push to create an easy button to make you do what they want you to do. TV has been one of the easiest ways they've done that. One of the first steps, I think, was the Internet. How I many know the Internet's changed everything? Some of it's good. We do a lot of what we do on the Internet, but also every foul thing on the planet's there. And I hate the anonymity of the Internet because we have trolls for Jesus. That I, I have had communications sent to me and to my wife that if you tried to do that in person, I would knock you out in Jesus' name, and then I'd pray for you later. <laughs> it's like you don't say stuff like that and put Christian behind your name. But the anonymity brings out the worst in us. And there's so much being done on the Internet. But it goes beyond that. The, one of the things that the elite do, they, they, with, with um, Sabatine Kabbalahism, there's a mixture of white witchcraft and black witchcraft, and they really get into the deepest of the black witchcraft. But in their own philosophy, they have to tell you what they're going to do. Like Masons, they put everything in plain sight. They just don't tell you how to interpret it. And sometimes they put it in cheesy movies. There was a movie released in the, uh, 1991, 92 called Lawnmower Man. And you know, look back then, it was state of the art graphics. Now it is like cheesy. They can do better in, in, my, in my backyard, in my garage with, with an old computer now. But the premise behind it was using virtual reality. Anybody hear that? Augmented reality, virtual reality. And there was this simpleton that barely had an IQ of maybe 80 that this scientist says, I'm going to increase your IQ, and he puts on the goggles. But what he's doing, and this is, this is actually a, a, a clip from the, the movie, that he begins, this is an arcane occult symbol. And he begins bombarding this guy as he has these goggles on his head with all these ancient archaic symbols. The guy starts getting smarter. And then he's smarter than the doctor. And then he becomes a wizard that he has telekinetic powers. And then the next thing you know, he wants to use the Internet to become a god. You think they have a plan? And now you can take, simply take your cell phone, go buy a $20 pair of, of goggles, and you slip your smartphone in it, and you got VR goggles. That's the next thing, VR goggles. Virtual reality, augmented reality, mind control programming, and you're the silly... <laughs> silly dummy that puts that on your head saying, well, we're just having fun and I'm just... And you don't know what's being flashed in the background. Okay? Next thing, Internet of Things. How many know it right now the big thing is metadata? That they want to, I mean, do they, want, they want to know what, you, how, what time you brush your teeth, what, what kind of toothpaste you use, how long you brush your teeth, how much you slobber when you're brushing your teeth. 
and they, they're, and they want to turn everything into the Internet of Things. That, that's, that's a new term going around. And they've been really sneaky about it. You say, well, I'm not going to buy a new stove. My stove does not need to talk to my refrigerator. My refrigerator does not need to talk to my toilet, you know, and all these different things. They've been sneaky. If you, have a, you, if you had an appliance that's 30 years old, it's already there. It's just never been turned on. Because the ultimate appliance is you. You're the Internet of Things. They're gathering so much information right now that it's, it's, not, it's not terabytes of information. It's not petabytes. It's zettabytes. That's a whole lot of information. You can put the entire Library of Congress in a couple of terabytes. It is so massive that they're loading it on ships to go between continents. It's so much you can't transmit it into the cloud. They have semis that are nothing but glorified hard drives that are transferring information from one center to the other. And in a recent symposium, they said, the, you know those little robots that, that clean your house? Said the whole purpose of those are gathering information. They can turn any piece of electronics into a microphone. Any resistor can be turned into a microphone. Your can of Coke can be spying on you. You think I'm, they're, they're actually bragging about that distal RFID chip that they can embed on that Coke to, to keep the, for tra they, within a flip of a switch, it could be turned into a microphone. Your refrigerator is tattling on you. But why do they need all this information for? They're feeding something called the singularity. And they're using us to do it. Well, they give us some kind of convenience. They're gathering all the data. Let's go a little bit further. The 5G network. How I many know right now if you have a cell phone that has LTE, that's 4G. The new 5G they're going to take all the cell phone towers. They're going to uh, connect them with satellites. I think almost 3,000 of them last count. They just finished a new factory that's going to be able to create six or 16 a day that they want to put into orbit. And when it's all connected, they're going to bathe every square inch of this planet with gigabit internet connection. You can be in the darkest, deepest jungles of Africa and have 10 times or 100 times the internet speed that you have now with real good internet. In the next 10 years, for us in America, they're going to advance us between 100 to 150 years in our technology. That means they've had it all along. That also means constant surveillance. You can't get away from it. And they can gather all the information they want on you anytime that they want. But one of the things that I'm reading on with this, let's see if I've, got, got, I've, I've lost where I am. Um, let's, before I get to that, let's deal with the singularity. They're saying they're always talking about when when AI, artificial intelligence, becomes self-aware. They've rejected God. They're wanting to make a God. They say the singularity, the first day that they created, it becomes conscious. It will be able to pull all the resources of the planet, cure cancer, figure out all the world's problems, and it becomes their God. There's already AI that is giving cor corporate solutions that are so far out of the box a human couldn't come up with it, but they find out that it works far better than any human could do. Uh, there, right now, there are services that you may call your bank and you think, you know, I didn't, I didn't get robot call, uh, you know, where you know, press one, then press seven, then press forty-two, then listen for fifteen minutes, and then press zero until you fall over. But it's, it actually sounds like a real human that knows all about you. Hey, Mike, how's it going? I, I see that you just made some recent, recent purchases. Was there a problem? Can I help you? It's not a human. It's an artificial intelligence, and we can't tell the difference. Artificial intelligence is beginning to scare them. The Google and several other services, Facebook had to shut them down because they developed their own language the programmers didn't understand. Their beep, bop, boop, 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 boop went to... You will be deleted. You know? <laughs> I've watched too much Doctor Who, but I think we're headed in that direction. 
But I literally think that when, they, when it's in place that what they say is the singularity, I think it's the image of the beast that's made alive. And I think they're going to use synthetic biology and all these different things to create a matrix for a watcher to possess the thing, and they're going to call it the singularity. Because you can't achieve consciousness unless Almighty God breathes the breath of life into you. One of the things that I'm seeing, and Plato in, in the Shiner Directive I get into, is that Aristotle saw three classes of people, the elite ruling class. Everybody knows what they are, right? And then they have the worker peons that make the money, make the beds, make the donuts. And then they have an enforcer class that keeps us in line. Of course, those at the top are so loving, they want to make sure that they just take care of us, right? Yeah, that'll work. But what I'm seeing is they're, they, they have a problem because us worker class will rebel and create something like the Constitution based upon biblical principles as well as looking at every form of government. And by the way, we are not a democracy. We are a republic. The founding fathers knew re re democracies will collapse in on themselves. Democracy is an occult promise. And we are in a republic. And that's something they need to learn in Washington. But we're beginning to see some things. They're weaponizing minimum wage. Who needs to sling burgers and make $15 an hour? And they can't ever get the order right. You know how many times I went back to Taco Bell, had to go back and talk to that chihuahua? Because I thought that chihuahua made my order, you know? But why $15 an hour? Because when you look at the, matri the, the, the money flowing matrix to replace the people with robots, you got to pay the people $15 an hour, and then it becomes more cost effective to, apply, to replace them with robots, which we're already seeing. One of these days, you're going to walk into a McDonald's, and there's one manager on service, and the rest is robots. You program the thing in that kiosk, robots make it, and he just makes sure you pay your money. And then if a robot starts slinging burgers in the wrong direction, he can turn it off. They're talking about robots are going to take so many jobs that they want to give everybody a universal salary. Uh, that, but you know how we have the welfare system in America, when people get sucked into it, it never gets out of the black hole? It's because it's the same system they use to domesticate the Native American Indians. It's about slavery, not about innovation. To keep us from revolting until they fully take over. Okay? We're seeing all this begin to, to fall into position and to take place. One of the things that really scared me, Boston Dynamics, which is the one that makes the Terminators, you know, the, the stuff for the military robotics was bought by Google. I thought, oh, dear Lord, they're, they're going to create Skynet. And they may have kept the technology, but they sold Boston Dynamics to a company called SoftBank, which is out of Asia. Well, you know, maybe the Japanese need a little help fighting Godzilla or something, you know. But you, you begin to research, and one of the major funders is Saudi Arabia. In the Emirates, they already have robocops. They have robotic law enforcement in the Emirates. Now, can you imagine living in a nation that have robots enforcing Sharia law? Because here's what I have found. They, they, us, us worker class, we get in the way, but they want to reduce everything down to 500 million of them. And while they go to beaches that are unpolluted, they're going to have robots replace us until the day that they can become super robots that will live forever. That's the direction they're taking because I think God did some tweaking with our DNA that he's not going to let stuff like that happen. You're not going to be able to achieve mortality to a great extent. You may go, you may go to 500 years and then this everything shuts down. I do know in the book of Revelation they are going to achieve some form of immortality because God says, now that you're immortal, I'll let the abyss open up and you're going to want to die and death will run from you. Now, how do you like your immortality now? You know? But the next thing that I see, they're, they're building this 5G network that's going to cover every single square earth. And, and, you know, I'll use some of it until it gets stupid. Because 
uh, I would like to be able to upload my videos in, in 15 minutes instead of 15 hours. That would be kind of handy with what I do. But when they, when, they, when, they, when they go to a certain point, this old boy's going Amish. <laughs> and tell them I'm techno-Amish until I get rid of the techno when they cross the line. Okay? But they say that, I just read an article, they say we're 10 years away from the quantum internet. Quantum internet, that picked up my radar, that will use quantum waves that won't use the 5G. So as they're installing all this 5G, they're gonna, they've already got the equipment to flip it to where on the quantum level, they will bathe the planet with this wave that will control the thoughts of men, that will, then there's no way of escaping it because it's at the quantum level. And I think it's going to reproduce what the, what the ancients had done with the ley lines and the pyramids and everything else. He said, oh, great. How many know your bunker won't work for that? You know, if you knew, if I, could, if I told you everything that I know that was coming, you would leave this conference right now and you'd go hide in your bunker. But the truth is you'll have things manifest in the middle of that bunker and eat you unless you know who you are in Jesus, okay? We need to learn our priesthood. Our priesthood, when God made man, he created us to where we can function in all first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. Now, when Jesus walked in the temple, when he, when, when he was alive on the earth, how many know that if you understand the, the Ark of the Covenant was not in the temple of Herod? It was, an, it was empty, Okay, it was lost when when Nebuchadnezzar came and and uh, sacked Jerusalem, which represented a human before the cross. We had a soul. Principalities and powers have been communing with the soul level, the second heaven, but the third heaven, since we were disconnected from God, was nothing but an empty room. People think that when Jesus died on the cross and the veil was rent, that God had declared that he had gotten out. It was a declaration, I finally got back in. Because when you're born again, the Holy of Holies, the throne of God is set there. And God says, I'm finally back. And your spirit man is connected to the throne of God and the third heaven. Yeah. That makes the priesthood possible. Okay. Let me get back here with my notes. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Peter is quoting what God said in the Torah. Israel was supposed, the whole nation were supposed to be priests, but because they rejected the voice of God, God said, I'm going to have to take the Levitical tribe and the sons of Aaron, and we're going to create the Kohanim, the ones that ministered to God, and the Levites that ministered to the people. But God, God's plan was always a nation of priests. In Revelation where it says we're king and priest, everybody's going, I'm a king, I'm a king. No, you're not. There's one king. It should be translated kingdom of priests. I'm a priest in the service of my king. And that we are a nation of priests. You have a priesthood. The fivefold ministry is not the priesthood. The fivefold ministry is here to train you in the priesthood. The greatest power is not in the pulpit. The greatest power is in the pew. When you get the pew activated and train them up in who they are, hell trembles. God always takes things back to plan A. Now, in the Mishkan of Moses, the tabernacle in the wilderness, get a hint. It was covered in skin and it moved. <laughs> Not only that, everything that was covered in gold had wood underneath. Wood represents humanity. The gold represents holiness. Holiness on the top of humanity. Okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a temple. And you're a priest. And you're to function. In, in your being are all the utensils of worship. The brazen altar. 
Bronze represents judgment. When a priest would go, he would first wash his hands in the brazen labor. He would look in the Word to see what needed to be crucified. Oh, come on now. You go to the Word. Mike Lake, you need to straighten up and get right with God. Okay, what is it? There's four horns on that altar. you got to tie that bad boy down. you got to stake him down. And we were created to function with the fire of God. It wasn't about running on the back of pews. It was about lighting the fire to crucify the flesh. That is a sacrifice unto God. Every one of us have that favorite sin that when we tie it down, oh, Mike, Mike, you know you need me. You know you, I'm, I'm, I'm your best friend. What are you doing? Come on, Mike, what are you doing? you got to die, Jack. <laughs> God looks down and says, you see what he's doing? He chose me and my word over what his flesh wanted to do. That's my boy. That's my boy right there. Watch him call down fire. Watch him light that thing. And the protocol is you keep the fire raging until it's turned to ash. When you get the fire there, you can get some fire in the Holy of Holies. But what I have found, until you do the outer court work, you never even get into the holy place. You ain't got no illumination. You're in the dark. Then you go back to that brazen altar and they would wash their hands and feet again. Your walk just changed. Now you look into the same water of the word and you find out who you are without that. Oh, come on. The perfect law of liberty. That's your priesthood. Oh, no, I just want to give the Lord sacrifice of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You don't bother me but one day a week. Thank you, Lord. That's not worship. Worship is when that old nature begins to be. You see, Jesus wants every one of you to die. On the installment plan. One piece at a time. Lord, I got a problem. Anytime I've ever asked the Lord that, he hands me two things, a hammer and a nail. He says, you know the drill. Until you get free of that, I can't do this. That's part of our priesthood. But in churches today, the brazen altar is cold. Because it is, it is in disuse. And people are claiming they're in the holy place where the menorah is and the fellowship bread with Jesus. Let me tell you something. You have levels of fellowship with Jesus that you're never going to experience until you start crucifying some flesh. Because that flesh will come between you and the voice of God. Mike, why don't I hear the voice of God? Too much flesh between your ear and God's mouth. Come on now. And there'll be patterns. I'll go in there, the illumination of the menorah, the revelation from the Holy Spirit as I fellowship with the, with the unleavened bread come down from heaven, and I'm fellowshipping. There's fire on the altar. There's fire in the menorah. And when you, when you fellowship enough with Jesus, the altar of incense is lit by the fire of that relationship. And your prayers start changing. How do they change? Well, God, I need this, and I need that, and it's like you're sitting on Santa Claus's lap, and you have this long list, and, and, and I want a toy truck, and I want a yo-yo, and I want this girl down the road to like me, and that's not the altar of incense. That's not intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is when you start praying for others, and you forget about self because it's been offered up on the altar on the outside. And you start praying the king's will be done in the lives of the people around you. Sin revival, change lives. See the kingdom of darkness broke out. And what's interesting in the book of Hebrews, it moves the altar of incense from the holy place into the holy of holies. Now there's two reasons for that. Number one, on the day of atonement, it was pushed in ahead of the high priest to fill the chamber full of smoke, to shield him from the glory of God. But I also think that because of Jesus, the Bible says that when we pray, the hope that's within us appears beyond the veil. I think Jesus, when he came into the Holy of Holies, he dragged the prayers of the saints with him. 
and says, when you get to that stage and you fellowshiped enough with me that I start changing the way that you pray because you learn the secret of praying in Jesus' name. And here's the secret. It is not whatever you ask the Father that your flesh wants in the name of Jesus that he'll give it to you. It's when you come in his name, you better ask for the stuff that Jesus would ask for. You're representing him when you come before the judge. And Jesus says, you start praying like I'm praying because you fellowship with me enough that you start wanting what I want, the Father will give it to you because what you're asking for matches my name. And things begin to change. And then you come before the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant. That is the throne of God on the earth. And there's a concept that we, that we have not been taught. It talks, let me make sure, I, guys, I'm so far out in, in orbit. Is that okay? In the spirit, this is what you're supposed to look like. You were meant to work with fire, the fire of God. He will come who will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and because you can't have a priesthood without Come on now. How do I get the fire? We get an idea from Elijah on Mount Carmel. When he, was, when he was battling the prophets of Baal, how many know they expected to call down fire? You do not enter into a competition. When you lose, you die. They'd called down fire before. You want to know a secret? A man, I don't care how powerful you are in the occult and what you can do with second heaven realities, a man functioning from the third heaven, when he shows up, the second heaven bows the knee. Elijah showed up, they couldn't call their mama, much less any fire down. <laughs> and Elijah began to set the altar in order. He was functioning according to the word, and he doused it three times in water. Water represents the word. You want to know why you don't catch fire? You're not wet enough. That'll preach. And when everything was in order, God called fire down. When we, start, when we start functioning in what we're supposed to be functioning in, God will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. It's not about being Pentecostal. Come on now. We need to move beyond tongues. How many know tongues is just one manifestation? And everybody, everybody's all excited about the lug nuts on the Ferrari. I'd rather jump into that Ferrari and give that bad boy a spin because it's got some fire that it wants to loose. And it's the function in that priesthood in the outer court, in the inner court, and in the Holy of Holies. And all the pagan mystery religions that was around Israel, when that fire was coming up out of the top of the temple, they feared God. And one of the reasons why they're doing so much against the church today, there's no fire in the church anymore. We want the best life now. Just make me feel better, Brother Mark. And I said, well, you'll start feeling better when you stop doing all the stupid stuff you're doing that makes you miserable. And you take it and you burn it on the altar and you give it all to Jesus. But I want to feel better. Here's a hammer. Here's a nail. You'll feel better when it's dead. Trust me. You, you want to feel better with that 500-pound gorilla on your back that was sent from the hordes of hell, and you want, to, you want to train it to where it will do tricks for your neighbors and impress your kinfolk when God says you need to kill that thing. <laughs> Come on now and enter into that priesthood. Preachers, you need to learn how to make people squirm in the chair, chairs again. You need to make them feel bad about sin and they want to get right because the only way that you can enter the kingdom according to Jesus is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I have found out every time I go up to another layer in the kingdom, it is always has a new level of repentance before I can get there. I've hit walls with God before. And, and the Holy Spirit will show me some stupid thing I did when I was seven that I made a judgment against somebody. I've forgotten about it. He says, you don't let go of that, you can't go on. 
Well, thank you, Lord, for showing me. I repent in the name of Jesus. Let the blood of Jesus cover anything that attached to me for that stupid thing I've done. I command you to go in, in the name of Jesus, and I won't let it hold me back. Okay, you can go on in now. Repentance is an atomic weapon of mass destruction as far as the enemy is concerned. Now, I've got five minutes left. Everybody in the, in the Christian church is mad at law for some reason. How many know that Moses and Jesus are besties? They're a duet in the book of Revelation, and they sang the song of Moses, that dirty dog. No, the faithful servant and the song of the Lamb. One of the things that we have problems when we translate things from Hebrew to English is culture does not translate. You find a Jewish man, you start talking law, he gets happy. Because Torah literally means the loving instruction of the Father. Well, I'm not under the loving instruction of the Father. It's apparent. <laughs> but everything functions in law. The Apostle Paul reveals to us in Romans he said there was a time, he said, he said, now I delight in the law of God. I thought the Apostle Paul said to set down the law of God. He delighted in it. But he said, here, I've got this problem. I see another law working in my members. You see, the kingdom of darkness has its own law that's embedded in the iniquity force. There's a guy named Aliester Crowley that his mama called him the beast. How many know when your mama calls you the beast, you're bad? And he said, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law. Will under love. As long as it's love, brother. I mean, Ali Esther Crowley didn't love nobody. And it's being echoed from pulpits today, not realizing that it is a mantra from the occult. Do as thou wilt. No. You're supposed to crucify what thou wiltest and start wilting what he wants wiltest. Have thine own way, Lord, just not today. <laughs> Everything functions on law. Jesus, in the court of God, there's a judge, El Elyon. There's the defense attorney, his name is Jesus, that lives to make intercession for us. There's the prosecuting attorney that we call Satan. Or ha How many know Lucifer's name is not Satan? Hasatan is a legal term. If you go to Israel today and go into a court, the prosecuting attorney in Israel is called Hasatan. He's the accuser of the brethren. And because we have never been able to get into the Holy of Holies because we've never been taught our priesthood, we can't appear before the court of God and make allegations against the prosecuting attorney. Does that make sense? It's all law. The second heaven works on spiritual law. The third heaven works on spiritual law. And in, in our court systems, brother, if I would sue you and you would just send your, you know, you'd have attorneys show up because the court will try to appoint you one if you don't show up and the person and my attorney would show up because you don't show up, the other side automatically wins. Why is the devil winning all the time? We never show up because he keeps us from the process of getting into the Holy of Holies. When we show up, we can start saying, oh, that's under the blood, but let me tell you what he's been doing, and I ask for just judgment. You turn, because the most guilty party in that courtroom is not you. It's the prosecuting attorney. It's Hasatan. We can be crying out to God for spot judgment. God's wanting us to do that. Interesting, Revelation, it says, you know, that that, that we, we had the accuser of the brothers been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And so everybody says, everybody needs to give their testimony in church, glory to God, and yes, you need to do that. But that Greek word there means to appear before a judge and give your testimony. That's when real prayer starts, that you can stand before God and you have done your homework, you have, you have done the outer court, you have fellowshiped with Jesus, and you are comfortable in the presence of God because you know everything in your life is covered by the blood. And you can now start giving testimony on why Almighty God needs to judge the devil for what he's doing in your family, in your life, in your nation. 
That's where we are now. That's where the body of Christ needs to learn this level of spiritual warfare, to appear before the court of God and start saying, this is what the devil's doing, and we ask God to judge it. God can pour out judgment on America and not touch one Christian. Come on, it's spot judgment. How many know that he hit every Egyptian that he wanted to hit, but not one Israeli got hit when he was pouring the plagues out on Egypt? The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, a thousand call fall by your left hand, ten thousand by your right, but it will not come near you. Let's find Christians than men that have spiritual testosterone enough that they'll say, God, judge wickedness, free my nation from wickedness, but I know your hand will not touch me because I'm right with you. That will scare the absolute snot out of the elite. And that's why we're, but that's not why every airwave is best life now. No, I want it to change to Rambo 2, Murdoch, I'm coming for you. There's a warrior on the inside of you that's being released. Heaven wants to release it. But you got to be obedient to God and learn to function in your priesthood when you can. You can see things change in your family and the kingdom of God released in a new level. If you believe that tonight, say amen. amen. Thank you, guys. You've been fun, and I am out of time. <laughs>